It's not often that we hear a homily based on the second reading in the Mass. And of course, I'm sure we've heard an endless line of homilies based upon our gospel reading today, the wedding at Cana. But the words of St. Paul are particularly relevant today, especially in light of an activity that the church is asking all of us, the Holy Father is asking the church throughout the world to participate in the weeks and the months ahead. And what does St. Paul talk about in our second reading today from the first letter to the Corinthians? He speaks of the different charisms that people have within the church. I'm not going to reread the entire reading, but it begins by saying there are different kinds of spiritual gifts but the same spirit, different forms of service but the same Lord, different workings but the same God who produces all of them in everyone. And then he goes on of these different gifts that people have, expression of knowledge, faith, gifts of healing, mighty deeds, prophecy, and so on. And the point he makes is that none of these gifts function in and of themselves, but they work together as an ordered whole to build up the work of the church and the mission that Jesus has given all of us to make disciples of all the nations, to preach the gospel to all peoples. In another place in the gospel, or excuse me, in one of Paul's letters, he speaks of the human body as the model for that, in which various body parts have different functions, the eye to see, the legs to move us, the hands for their function, the mind for the thinking, the stomach for digestion, the heart, and so on. And one function does not act in a vacuum. All of them work together for the function of the body. The legs propel us forward, but it doesn't do it without the inclusion of the eyes that see and help us determine what direction we should go. And even if someone is blind and without the gift of sight, say they move with the use of a cane, what they feel with their hands, helps in directing the legs, and so on. Neither function is done in isolation, but the entire body works as an ordered whole. And that is how the church functions. We don't all have the same task or the same charism or the same calling. You don't have the calling of a priest, which I have in consecrating the Eucharist here at the altar. The deacon has his role. I certainly don't have the role of the archbishop or the Holy Father. But all of us work together as a community of faith, as a church, to take on and carry out that task of proclaiming the gospel to all the nations. And we function as an ordered whole in which no single group or charism or figure or task is done in isolation. Perhaps the best illustration of that, and you'll have to beg give me a little indulgence here because every now and again I, I do like to uh, call on the congregation at times of Mass. You look at the worship in which we engage in here as we prepare to celebrate and receive the Eucharist. Each one of us has a different task, but it's not done in isolation. My role is to lead the people in prayer as a shepherd, as a pastor, as a priest offering the sacrifice. All of us have the task as a royal priesthood in our baptism to offer worship to God. The cantor is not there to perform a solo or the choir to perform a concert, but to lead all of us in our singing, our song, as we raise our voices in worship of God. And when we all do our parts, that worship we are called to give is done more fully, more vibrantly, and more substantially. And yet, how well do we function? How well do we fulfill those tasks? How often is it a case where the cantor merely does a solo, the choir merely gives a concert? Every now and again, I like to remind the people of the role you have in this worship, in prayers that I, as a priest, don't say because they are prayers of the people. For example, I don't say the word amen at an end of a, of a prayer. When we pray the Our Father, we pray the Our Father together, 
The priest prays the what's called the embolism, deliver us, Lord, we pray from every evil himself. But then at the end, the doxology is prayed not by the priest, although we may see some priests who do pray it, but we are not to pray that prayer. That's a prayer of the people in response to the embolism prayer that the priest prays after the Lord's Prayer that we pray together. And yet, how often does the priest have to compensate because the people's participation is low? In fact, if I were to turn off the microphone and suddenly speak just in the regular tone that I have, that I'm speaking to you now, and I have seen it in previous parishes, not here, but in a previous assignment, how many would feel compelled to say, we can't hear you, speak louder. I already saw a couple of people leaning forward <laughs> as I got to this point in the homily. But how often does it occur to any of us that while you might not be able to hear the priest, most of the time, the priest cannot hear you. And yet we are called to worship together as an ordered whole with our own tasks that are not done in isolation as we come together to give a full worship as a community of faith to our Heavenly Father through Jesus in the Holy Spirit as we prepare to receive this Eucharist. And that is in accord with what Paul speaks of in today's reading. Now, why is this important? It's important always, but especially in these next few weeks and coming months, as the church will be engaging next year in 2023 in a meeting of bishops that is called a synod that will take place in Rome. Now, a synod is a meeting of a group of bishops throughout the world, and it is distinct from a council, like we've heard of the Second Vatican Council, which was the 21st of a series of councils that have occurred throughout the church's history. A council, which we refer to also as an ecumenical council, is a meeting of all the bishops throughout the world. They all come together, with very few exceptions, if any, to discuss matters pertaining to the church, its teachings, and its work. A synod is a meeting of some of the bishops, and perhaps a few other church leaders, to discuss matters of how the church will move forward, the experience of the church throughout the world, of the church's ministry, the church's preaching and teaching, and how it can more effectively move forward in the future in carrying out its task of bringing the gospel to all the nations. But the bishops are not going to do this in isolation or in a vacuum. The process that it has asked the church throughout the world to engage in the next few weeks is to hear from the people of God throughout the world of their experience of the church and how it can contribute to the discussion of the bishops when they meet in Rome next year. In other words, the bishops and the leaders of the church want to hear from all of us there's a term that we use in the church, it's called the census fidei, the sense of the faithful. Unfortunately, many people interpret that to mean the faithful sands the leadership of the church, the people, as distinct from the priests or the bishops. But actually, the sense of the faithful is the sense of all of us together. All of us are part of the church throughout the world. And that is the sense that the bishops want to get as they ask us to participate in this process of preparation for this synod. They want to hear the input from the people. Now, of course, I think we all know that those could be famous last words when it comes to asking the people's involvement. Because invariably, as with any kind of listening session, there are those who will take it merely as an opportunity to complain, to nag, or to say, well, the church just needs to change this teaching, or needs to change that teaching, or needs to be more accepting of thus and so, but let me be clear, neither the apostles nor even Jesus himself changed a teaching because people demanded it. However, there were times when Jesus did preach, and we can see in his interaction with the people that his preaching was not done in isolation. There were moments when the people responded with questions, concerns, clarifications. To name just a few examples, Lord, teach us to pray. From that, we got the Lord's Prayer. 
Lord, what is the greatest commandment? Lord, what must I do to inherit eternal life? We all love to give St. Thomas the Apostle a hard time because, after all, he doubted. But if he had not raised the question, how am I to know that Jesus has been risen from the dead if I haven't seen it with my own eyes? A question that, no doubt, countless early Christians were asking. Without that issue being raised, Jesus would not have responded. Blessed are those who have not seen but still believe. And, And yet, what do we do? We put our faith in the testimony of those who have seen. Keeping with Thomas, it was Thomas who asked the question, Lord, we don't know where you are going. How can we know the way? Without that question, we would not have had the answer. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Philip says to Jesus, well, just show us the Father, and that will be enough for us. To which Jesus responded, anyone who's seen me has seen the Father. This is the kind of interaction the church is asking that we engage in in this preparation period for the synod that will take place next year. Toward the end of Mass, we will ask for your indulgence after the announcements as Deacon Chris will speak just a little bit about what this will entail. But we would like to get as great a participation as we can from the people of God, and especially here in San Francisco, so that your input can be heard as part of this process, because we are all a part of the faithful. We all have this task before us to preach the gospel. We all have the input that we must give on how it can become more relevant and more real in a world that Jesus has promised us will always be hostile to it, and yet it is our task to bring that gospel to the world. And we, the leaders of the church, don't do it in a vacuum, and all of us are called to participate in that process. So let us see our task as fulfilling the words that Paul says in today's second reading. We all have our different tasks. We all have our different gifts. We all have our different roles and different charisms. But we come together as an ordered whole, as a church throughout the world, to fulfill the task of evangelization that Jesus has given us. And that is what this synod is asking us to participate in as we come together to let our voices be heard, to give our input, to ask our questions, not to demand a change in teaching or a change in tradition, but to help direct the leadership of the church as they lead all of us throughout the world in the task that Jesus has given us with all our gifts, as different as they are, to bring the gospel to all the nations and make disciples throughout the world. Good afternoon. It is good to be with you this evening, this afternoon, and I'd like to uh, speak a bit about uh, this incredible effort by our Holy Father, Pope Francis. But first, let us recall the day and the moment over 2,000 years ago when the disciples of Jesus, the 12 apostles, and many of the 72 original disciples gathered in the upper room. They were in a state of wonderment where will we go from here after the crucifixion? Well, I'll tell you where we have arrived. 2,000 years later, we now have 100, no, I'm sorry, one and a half billion Catholics around the world, in every continent, in every nation, on every island, every frontier of the world. But we're not done. In pondering the future of the church in this third millennium for the fourth millennium to come, the descent of the Holy Spirit is among us. And Pope Francis, the Vicar of Christ, is inviting us into a new venture. This is an unprecedented movement by the Pope, calling for feedback by the laity, by every member of the Catholic faith around the world. Pope Francis invites every Catholic to advise them on how to discern the church's path forward. This is critical for us because unlike any other survey that you would get, this is actually a spiritual exercise because it is a gathering of your life experience as a committed Catholic. We need, this is a gathering of information, wisdom, and insight according to your path as as a disciple of Jesus. 
what we have set up or what the church has set up is a particular kind of survey. It's done in two formats. The first is to be able to do it on the computer. And you'll receive, you are receiving this today. The first address on the in, for the internet address is to give you an orientation about the intention, about the vision, mission, goals, objectives, and activities of this effort. The second address is to actually to, is to take the survey. The survey is in 19 different languages, so language is not a barrier. Down the line, uh, later on, uh, in, in the next two months, we're going to ha be having in-person sessions with members of the Catholic Leadership Institute to facilitate the taking of this survey in person for those of you that are not able to uh, operate a computer. So you're, in, you're going to be invited to do t that experience of one-to-one. -one. We're also going to set up a special session for our Spanish language community in which Father Arturo Albano and myself and Guadalupanas de San Francisco will gather together to conduct that in Spanish. But as I said, whatever your ethnicity, whatever your first language is, we will have the survey in that language. I have to say something about the time and place in which we live. I often say to my friends in my lectures that uh, during the Age of Reason, people didn't wake up in the morning and say, well, we're in the Age of Reason. Or they woke up and said, we're right in the middle of the Renaissance. There was no self-awareness of where they were in terms of human history. But in our time in history, we are aware through the lens of faith that the Holy Spirit is among us and that the Holy Father is gathering the flock to inspire through fraternal dialogue with each other about our particular spiritual journey toward heaven. The other thing to recognize is ultimately whatever our countries of origin are, you and I are citizens of heaven. We're in preparation to bring everyone to heaven. I love that beautiful uh, face of this cathedral where you see Jesus, the risen Christ, in the front of this cathedral, and you see the, the ladders or the steps to heaven and all the people of different cultures rising to the surface, to the summit. This is part of this journey. And I invite you to walk with us. Walk with the Holy Father. Walk with the bishops and with the priests and the deacons and the women religious. The most important component of this feedback is the role of the baptized, the laity. You are loved. You are loved by God. You are loved by your church. We need you now. Also, if you miss this opportunity, it would be very sad because you're being asked. And you can see uh, the photograph in front of this beautiful uh, flyer. You see the Pope leaning forward to listen. He speaks with eloquence. He also listens with eloquence. He will compile the feedback from every nation, from every archdiocese and diocese around the world. He will gather the fruit of that labor and produce a document that will blueprint our way forward into the next millennium. I pray that you will join us. I will be in the back of the cathedral today with Father, and I'll be happy to hand this out to you if you do not already have it in your hand. I also want to challenge something for each of us, because we are called to evangelize individually, as families, and as a community. How do you do that? This is important. Take this message back to your family. This is for every generation. It is not just for people who are of a particular age. Evangelize within your family, your extended family, your workplace, and your community. This is an invitation by the Holy Father himself. I pray you will say yes to walking with us in this great effort, this global effort, unprecedented. Be part of the history by making the history. Thank you, and God bless you. Thank <laughs> you.